Vas-y. Good afternoon, Paul. Just checking that uh, you can hear me and see me. Yes, Minister. We're, I'm here at the podium. You're on my right. Great. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. And I'm uh, joined today by the Chief Medical Officer of Australia, Professor Paul Kelly. And um, it's a difficult day in Victoria, but there are important reasons for hope and there is real momentum in the vaccination program. In particular, uh, we have just had the highest three-day period in the entire rollout, even though we're at over 80% first doses. And so that's real momentum. Um, Australians stepping forward, uh, a million and 18,000 vaccinations over a three-day period, the highest three-day period in the rollout. And what that says is that uh, Australians are still coming forward in record numbers to be vaccinated. And uh, if you haven't been vaccinated, or if you're due for your second dose, now is your time. Please do not wait. Please come forward. Please protect yourself. Please protect everybody else in the community. And please help bring us closer to those uh, freedoms, which is such an inalienable part of our daily existence as Australians. Uh, very significantly, we've had uh, 330,000 vaccinations in the last 24 hours, which uh, to last night took us to 29.97 million vaccinations. So at about 10 a.m. today, Australia will have passed the 30 million vaccination mark. Uh, building on that, uh, what we know is that that means we're now at 81.5% uh, of first doses and 60.2% second doses. Australia has now passed the 80% mark for first doses and the 60% mark for second doses. Um, what that means in the international context is in terms of whole of population first dose coverage, we've not only passed the USA, but we've now passed Israel and the EU. And um, that's a measure of what Australians are doing by coming forwards. But there's more work to be done, and I would uh, emphasise what I said earlier, to continue to urge people to come forward. Uh, one other critical thing there is that uh, our pharmacies, I, I want to give them a, a, a shout out today. They've passed the one million vaccination mark and uh, to the Pharmacy Guild and the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, uh, respectively. They and all their members have played a, a great job in vaccinating Australians uh, at the moment. AstraZeneca, Moderna, they're being delivered uh, in our pharmacies and they're helping to drive these record numbers. So uh, if you haven't been vaccinated, call your doctor, call your pharmacy, call a Commonwealth vaccination clinic, call the uh, state clinic and uh, any of these will have uh, uh, opportunities. Now, uh, when we look at what these vaccinations mean, we can see in New South Wales as uh, those numbers of it dropped from being approximately 1,500 a day at, a, at the peak. Um, they're now um, almost a, a third of the numbers in Victoria. But that vaccination program provides uh, real reasons for hope in Victoria. And, and I know those numbers are confronting, but I also know that the vaccination numbers are going to make a huge difference. We can see that in New South Wales, and Paul can talk to that uh, more generally, but uh, as first doses and second doses rise, the protection rises. And uh, that has led to not just the flattening of the curve, but the dropping of numbers in New South Wales, and that will have the same impact in Victoria. Uh, another important part of what we're doing is the uh, booster program, and I'm pleased to be able to announce the first stage of the booster program today. Um, we've received advice from uh, uh, ATAGI, the Australian Technical Advisory Group in immuno, uh, on Immunisation, uh, recommending that uh, boosters or third shots be made available for the immunocompromised. And so we'll move to do that uh, from Monday. This is for the severely immunocompromised, a group of uh, up to 500,000. Uh, Paul, uh, as Chief Medical Officer, will speak uh, more to that. But it's about providing additional protection. 
uh, the uh, next stage, the general population stage of the booster program, uh, we're expecting advice from ATAGI uh, before the end of October. And uh, we'll share that with the public, but we have uh, over 150 million uh, vaccines that are secured for the future. And so we're able to uh, implement that uh, on the time frame and uh, with the urgency and immediacy uh, that is uh, suggested uh, by ATAGI if and when they provide that. But we're expecting that before the end of October. Uh, in terms of uh, other elements, uh, the Chief Medical Officer has extended the hotspot in Victoria, and uh, Paul will speak to that. And then another very important thing, whilst we're doing our vaccination work, uh, is to continue the work of health protection around the country. Uh, one issue which I think will be immensely important to parents and to players is concussion in sport. Uh, concussion uh, affects uh, many Australians on a temporary basis and uh, over 700,000 Australians have some form of, of brain damage. Uh, concussion in sport can creep up. It's not just one incident, but uh, having met with uh, Michael Tuck and uh, the family uh, of, of Shane Tuck to, to talk with people about repetitive concussion and the impacts is to understand how families' lives can be devastated and individuals doing something they love can nevertheless have long-term impacts. So uh, I'm delighted that as part of our traumatic brain injury mission, a $50 million mission, um, we are uh, sponsoring the Australian Institute of Sport uh, to lead a nationwide focus on concussion in sport. This is about protecting our sports players, helping to prevent concussion and helping to treat and recover from concussion. Uh, it's about giving people a long-term future so as they can play the sport they love whilst protecting the brain, which is so fundamental to every element of their being and their lives. So with that, um, I'm uh, pleased to turn over to uh, Professor Paul Kelly, the Chief Medical Officer. Um, thank you, Minister, <clears throat> and good morning. Um, so uh, just to follow up on a couple of the issues that the Minister raised. So firstly, about the, uh, the third doses. So this is, for, this is part of the ongoing work of ATAGI. Uh, they are continuing to look at the, uh, at the situation internationally, uh, look at the scientific evidence in relation to vaccines and their effectiveness uh, that we're learning all the time from the rest of the world as well as here in Australia. Uh, so the announcement today is about the start of, the, of, this, uh, of this program, which can start uh, from today, um, uh, certainly from next week, uh, that uh, in relation to people, it's a very specific group of the population uh, that have uh, a, an issue with their immune system. So we know that vaccines work uh, by stimulating the immune system to produce antibodies against, against uh, COVID. Uh, it's the same for all vaccines. That's how they work. Uh, and unfortunately, some people that have... Uh, have immune systems that don't work as well as the, the general population, um, those vaccines may not cause, uh, may not lead to that protection. Uh, and so the evidence is now clear uh, that people in those categories of immune compromised uh, should receive a third dose uh, that should happen um, uh, at, at a period after the, uh, after the second dose, um, between two and six months after, after that time of the second dose. Um, so the, there is now a, a statement up on the on the website in health, um, listing the the people that are are now eligible for that third dose. Um, I, I will be writing today to all medical practitioners, as I've done uh, on several occasions through the through the vaccine rollout, uh, just to clarify that that position and to and to uh, give that guidance, um, and, and so that that can commence now. Um, unfortunately, for some people in that position, even a third dose won't, uh, won't lead to the same sort of response uh, that two doses give for people that have intact immune systems. Uh, but at this stage, uh, the ATAGI advice is for a third dose, uh, not beyond that. Uh, there are other elements there that I can go into during the question, questions and answers. But just to give you a sense of, of who is covered, it's people that, have, that were already um, uh, seen in, in phase one of the uh, of the vaccine rollout to be priority groups, so people with active um, active blood uh, blood malignancy, blood cancer, um, people with other other types of malignancy as well, 
people that have had uh, organ transplants, people that have had uh, stem cell uh, transplants, people on immunosuppressive therapy. So there are uh, people, of course, that have had transplants that, are, that have, uh, have medications to dampen their immune system. Uh, but there are others on, on certain types of, of arthritis um, uh, medication and steroids, for example. Uh, those that are born with immunodeficiency, there is a, a, a group of, of those as well as, um, as people that are living with HIV who are not controlled uh, in, in, uh, under therapy, so if their, their CD4 count is low. So for people in those, those settings, um, I certainly encourage them to have a discussion with their, their, their medical practitioner as, as soon as possible and to book in for a third dose. Um, the other, uh, I'll be also releasing a statement today which, uh, which is a, uh, around uh, a new policy of furloughing of, of, uh, of healthcare workers. This is something that's been agreed uh, with states and territories as we move into a phase of living with COVID. And as we know, there are three jurisdictions that are really in that phase already. And as we get further protection with the rollout of vaccination, it's important that we, we look closely and carefully at how we are handling outbreaks of disease. And that's particularly the case in healthcare settings. I would include their primary care settings, GP surgeries and the like, um, pharmacies uh, and aged care and disability care settings. Um, so uh, there are new guidelines that are being released today. Um, there's a media statement that's just being, just being put out from me um, relating to that. And it essentially does uh, start to move towards um, uh, what, what can happen when people are vaccinated. So this is, again, a call out for anyone that's working in, in health care, in aged care, in disability care. Uh, this is now the time for you to, to get those vaccinations if you have not yet done so. It will not only protect you, it will protect those you're caring for. And in this new furloughing policy, will allow uh, those workplaces to continue to work with the, with the workforce that is protected. Um, so I wanted to talk about that. Um, the, the third element is really, as, as uh, uh, Minister Hunt has mentioned, a, a difficult day for, for Victoria, but there is hope. Um, we've, we're seeing what is happening in New South Wales with our three, er three ways we can mitigate against the, the spread of the virus. We have public health and social measures, uh, lockdowns in, in various, various places and other, other ways of limiting the spread of the, of the virus. We have uh, our testing, tracing, isolation and quarantine measures and importantly, the, the spectacular and, in, and, and increasingly spectacular rollout of the, of the vaccine in right across Australia, but particularly in Victoria, in New South Wales and ACT, where they're uh, getting to record numbers. So as the vaccine uh, rollout goes, uh, increases, we know that that does have an effect. We're seeing that right now in New South Wales, where they have, they have gone past that peak, uh, both in cases and particularly uh, in hospitalisations and ventilation, that will happen. Uh, people in, in ICU, I mean, um, that will happen in Victoria in the coming weeks. Um, I'm absolutely certain that will be the case. Um, we know that in Victoria, there, most of the people that are being affected by the virus are young, um, uh, in, in their uh, young adults and uh, teenagers and children. Uh, and we know that they are the ones that are less likely to be severely affected by the virus. But it's very important that they take up the opportunity, those that can get vaccinated, uh, so anyone over the age of 12, and that should continue over the coming weeks. So I'll leave it there uh, now and I'll, I'll, we'll pass to questions. Minister, I'll, I'll let you um, take control of that. Thanks, Paul. And uh, if they could just flip the camera to the, um, the rest of the room, please. Thank you very much. So we'll start on the, the left and, uh, and work across. And so if you could identify yourself um, starting as I look out at the room from the left and we'll just uh, work over, please. Is that me? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Uh, I've got two questions. I'm not sure if it's Professor Kelly or the Minister, but just in terms of the furloughing policy, perhaps one for you, Professor Kelly, are you saying that fully vaccinated healthcare staff will no longer need to self-isolate if they come into contact with a COVID case? And for you or the Minister, um, WA has the lowest vaccination rates in the country and the Police Commissioner has set a New Year's Eve deadline to reach 80% fully vaxxed. That's like two months after other states and territories. Complacency is you know, clearly a problem there. I'm just wondering what the government is thinking to try and actually get vaccination rates up in states like WA. To start, Minister. Vaccinations. Sorry, Minister, I think your audio cut out. 
Oh, if Paul could start on furloughing, please, and I'll start on WA after that. Okay. So the um, so there's a uh, there's a whole uh, raft of of, of uh, issues in relation to to the furloughing policy. So it's not quite as simple as what you said, but in 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 other ways it kind of is. Uh, so the vaccination of the uh, healthcare worker is an important component, but also the nature of the of the spread within a healthcare setting. So uh, it would depend uh, on all of the things we've got used to, wearing of masks, um, the nature of the interaction between someone who's positive and that healthcare worker, their vaccination status, uh, all of these things are, are, are uh, taken into account and there's a matrix there. Um, ultimately, it will, be a, it will be a decision of the healthcare setting and their local public health unit to decide on, on the actual nature of that. But it does open up that possibility because of the protection that comes from vaccination and because of the need for us to, protect, to have our healthcare working during this period. Um, uh, that's all taken into account. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good document. It's been agreed by all states and territories uh, and it gives guidance very carefully and clearly to the local public health response. So on Western Australia, uh, the message is very clear. Please do not wait. Do not hesitate um, because at some stage, our presumption is that everybody will be exposed to COVID and the best protection is to ensure that you are vaccinated. We're working with the uh, West Australian government. We're encouraging the West Australian people and they're doing an excellent job, but uh, there's no barrier to be vaccinated. There are vaccination places available across Western Australia. Uh, there are vaccine supplies. Uh, we're seeing record uptake around the country. And so the opportunity is there. And uh, I would simply say that uh, if anybody thinks that uh, they're immune simply because of borders. That is uh, not the case. That our presumption is that at some point, everyone will be exposed or is at the risk of being exposed to COVID and the best protection is to be vaccinated. So we'll continue to provide the supply, but we'll work with everybody to encourage them to, to take it up. Now, I think there was Jono, is it, behind? Yeah, it is, Minister. Thanks very much. Just in relation to Pfizer, we've seen the FDA in America uh, receive a submission from Pfizer for five to eleven-year-olds. If that was successful, what time frame would you like to see Pfizer make a similar submission to the TGA here? Given you said you wanted it done at the same time, and could we see primary school children vaccinated fully before they go back to school next year? So I've uh, spoken with the uh, head of Pfizer Australia today and uh, encourage Pfizer to submit uh, their data um, and their application for uh, childhood vaccination at the earliest possible time. Um, they've only just commenced that process uh, with the FDA in uh, America, uh, but they're already engaging with our Therapeutic Goods Administration and uh, I'm encouraging them to submit at the earliest possible time. We have the supply and uh, as soon as there is uh, uh, an application uh, and an approval which uh, will be done as uh, a priority approval um, and there is a target advice, we're in a position to provide uh, those vaccinations, which is exactly what we did with uh, 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, what we were able to do through uh, general practice, through pharmacy uh, and through state and Commonwealth hubs was uh, just to keep the process going and uh, we're at 49% of 12 to 15 year olds, so three and a half weeks in. And uh, I think that's a really, really powerful sign um, as to how quickly we can vaccinate a population group. So the, the answer to the question is, um, as soon as there is uh, an application, an approval and a recommendation from Pfizer, the TGA and the TAGI respectively, we can commence immediately. And uh, next, going across, I think it's Sarah, is it? Stella from 10. Thank you, Minister. Um, just could you clarify how many doses we would need to cover the eligible population of 5 to 11 year olds? And just on the brain health study, if you could clarify, are you asking for living retired athletes to participate or would you need athletes to donate their brain after their death? Uh, so uh, the, the first thing is in terms of the doses. Um, you have approximately 315,000 kids uh, in each each year level. Um, so uh, we're looking here at uh, at six years 
uh, or so, uh, seven, seven years all up. Um, so we're looking at approximately uh, 1.8 to 2 million uh, first doses. When we purchased, we purchased the whole of population double dose. Uh, so we have already available the full number of doses that are required. And uh, I would hope that uh, if it is approved, uh, as many of that population of uh, 5 to 11 uh, inclusive uh, do take it up. Um, so it'll be in the order of uh, uh, just over 2 million uh, Australian children that will be eligible and uh, we would encourage as many as possible. But I've got to say, three and a half weeks, 49% for the 12 to 15-year-olds. Uh, the parents have stepped up and the, uh, the uh, older kids and teens have stepped up. And so uh, there's full vaccine that is available. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the brain health, um, uh, what that does is uh, it's an evaluation of brain health of retired elite level athletes. So uh, that's done uh, in the medical processes are done, obviously, in a way which uh, ensures that uh, everybody is protected and cared for. And uh, if there are those that have passed that wish to donate their brain tissue, then obviously that's a, a gift that, that they can give. All right. Uh, next uh, in the front. Oh, me. Um, when can the wider Australian population expect their booster shots? Is there a rough time frame, Minister? And uh, what will be our booster uh, vaccine supply that we're getting? And will they be ad adequate given those vaccine swap deals that we've done with other nations? And if I may, Professor Kelly, I'm just interested to know when immunity starts to wane in terms of the, after the second COVID shot. If you could give us a bit of information on that, that would be appreciated. Sure. Uh, so we have 150... Uh, 1 million doses uh, available. And so um, uh, we've covered, as we always do, with different contingencies. Uh, we have 85 million Pfizer. We have uh, 50, uh, 15 million uh, additional Moderna. We have 51 million Novavax, uh, which is the protein-based vaccine that's currently completing its trials and uh, is expected to uh, submit applications uh, both in the USA, Australia and elsewhere um, in, uh, in the coming weeks. Um, ultimately up to the company. So we have a very, very strong supply pipeline, enough to uh, meet uh, all Australian needs. And uh, we had provisioned on the basis of uh, were there to be not just one, but two boosters, um, which at this stage it appears more likely to be one, then we were covered for that circumstance. Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, when, uh, we're expecting advice from Otagi on general population uh, booster programs uh, before the end of the month. And uh, we're in a in a position to commence at uh, whatever time they recommend. And with, and with our suppliers, will they be affected by those vaccine swap deals? No. So in terms of waning immunity, this is something that we've been aware of for, for uh, some months now. Uh, there's a lot of information that's coming from quite large studies from other countries that have obviously had many more people vaccinated because of the size of their population, uh, at least that. Um, so we do have information now about, about waning immunity but in relation to um, the effect on transmission. That's the thing that wanes first. Um, and there is actually quite a number of clinical trials now going on on different ways of giving giving vaccines, and so to to uh, to deal with immunity in the nose, for example, um, that, as part of that part of that work. Um, what does remain very strong, and these and just to be very clear, all th all three of the vaccines that are being used in Australia right now uh, are very strong in protection against severe disease. And that continues. Um, there is a much lower waning of immunity over time uh, for that effect, which is the most important effect of the vaccines, uh, as compared with the transmission effect. So these are, these are matters that will need to be taken into account in the way that Otagi is looking at this. Um, but certainly over, over the three to six months, uh, uh, or up to eight months, we, we do feel that's probably the time when, when we need to consider whether a booster should be used for the general population, but we'll be guided by Otagi's way of looking at this. Uh, and so, as the Minister said, we're expecting to have that formal advice by the end of the month, but I'm speaking very frequently, at least weekly, with uh, my Otagi colleagues on this matter. And 
And so given that time frame that you just said, does that mean when uh, the booster shots do get rolled out that the people that got their COVID jabs first would be the first to get their booster shots? Is that how it would work? Well, that, that's the advice we're looking for from Atagi. Uh, but but the, I, I guess the general principle is the longer since your first your second dose, um, the, the more likely it is that, that that immunity will have waned to a certain extent. Uh, and so uh, that timing will be an important consideration. Yeah, so what we're expecting there is that there'll be a common time frame that after a certain period of time, uh, you're invited to uh, attend for uh, a booster shot. Now, we'll still await that advice on general population, but we're ready and we're prepared. And, and interestingly, having um, passed uh, the USA, Israel, and, and now the EU in terms of uh, first doses for general population, but having a much more uh, recently vaccinated population, we're in a very strong situation in terms of national immunity. And as those second doses continue to rise, today we've passed 60% for second doses, we're at 80% for first doses, then that will provide more uh, coverage and on a, a very, very contemporary basis, so the best possible protection. If I'll go to the back of the room, please. Yes, thank you, Minister Nick Bonnie-Hady from the Sydney Morning Herald here. Uh, to Professor Kelly, can you mix and match booster shots? Do you need to get the same shot that you got your initial vaccines? And uh, as I understand it, Atagi is advising that an mRNA vaccine, whether Pfizer or Moderna, is preferred to Vaxevria, the AstraZeneca vaccine, for the third dose. Why is that? And then finally to the Minister, with the um, vaccine booster shot program, there's been a huge disparity in vaccination rates between the developed world where vaccination rates are generally very good in the developing world where they're very poor and deaths are higher. Is that something that Australia has taken into account in designing and interpreting the advice of the experts on booster shots? Okay, I'll let Paul go first and I'll respond. Um, so uh, thank you for the, for the question. Yes. So the uh, the advice uh, which is now now public is is exactly as you described. Firstly, I'd, I'd say that does, that is that could definitely should not be interpreted that AstraZeneca is not a good vaccine. It is a good vaccine, uh, but for the for the booster shots, the recommendation is to go for one or other of the of the uh, mRNA vaccines as the booster. The preference is to go for a third dose of the one you had the two you had first. So if you've had two Pfizer, the third one would be Pfizer. No one's had two of Moderna yet, so it'll be likely be Pfizer. Um, but if Pfizer is not available or, or unable to be uh, taken, Moderna would be substituted. Um, in certain circumstances, there may be a need to actually use AstraZeneca, for example, with uh, some of those, the, 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 side, the side effects of the second dose of, of an mRNA vaccine that would not be recommended to get a third one uh, if that was the case. So, so there is flexibility, um, but the, the general principle is uh, mRNA vaccine as a third dose. Yeah. And, uh, and Nick, just in terms of um, support for uh, <clears throat> uh, developing nations, we're committed to 60 million doses to support developing nations, but we're also very aware uh, that we have the capacity um, if uh, there are additional doses available uh, within Australia to do exactly what we've done with AstraZeneca and to provide those as well for other countries. And I know us being able to supply directly to Fiji, for example, at a time when they were having a major outbreak, uh, allowed them to achieve uh, an exceptionally high vaccination rate very quickly. They basically had uh, a, a very large number of uh, Australia's AstraZeneca, we had sufficient for us. We immediately made sure that was provided to the region. Fiji is one example, but it's it's been provided right around the region. So we'll continue to do that. And uh, those vaccines that we've contracted are an insurance for Australians, but they're also an insurance policy for the region. And then uh, last of all, in the in the back corner, please. So just if I could follow up, Professor Kelly, so I understand correctly, if you've had two doses of AstraZeneca, the booster shot is still preferred to be Moderna or Pfizer for that person. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Minister Rob Scott here from Seven News. Can I just um, ask you, I know you said it's going to be about eight months um, uh, when you get your booster after you've had your, your last uh, shot. Do you think this will become like a, uh, a flu shot where we have it every year or is it still too far away to, to know that? And uh, are uh, frontline healthcare workers going to be among the first, seeing as they were in 1A along with immunocompromised people to get a booster? 
Sure. So, look, uh, two things here. I, I'm not putting a time frame on uh, the booster. That will be very much a, a medical uh, decision and guidance, and we'll follow that guidance as, as we've done. So that's completely something which ATAGI will advise on, and they'll look at the international data, the domestic data, and the product information. Uh, the, uh, the second thing is um, how we roll out the, uh, the boosters will follow time. So it's a time-based program. So those that uh, had their earliest vaccinations will be those that have access. But uh, there's no issue of supply right now. Um, there's uh, supply right around the nation for those that wish to be vaccinated. As you've seen, with the three highest day period uh, which has just been completed. So the highest three-day period for vaccination in the entire program, even though we're above 80% first dose, is the last three days. So that says that there's both supply and demand, and we've got even greater supply going forward. So there's enough vaccinate, uh, vaccine, there's enough vaccine for every Australian to have first and second doses, uh, and there's enough vaccine for every Australian as they come due for boosters to have that. Uh, in terms of subsequent uh, doses, whether it becomes um, an annual situation, that'll be a global medical question, and uh, Paul's probably better placed to judge that. But uh, if that's the medical advice, we're prepared to implement it. Paul? Um, so at this stage, it looks likely a third dose is, is all we know about. Um, remember that we're only a year, less than a year into the into this uh, endeavour right across the world. So at the moment, it appears a third dose will be enough, uh, but it, it will just need to see. One of the issues that's come up uh, in uh, previously uh, in relation to this is the effect of other, other variants of concern. Um, to the previous question, it's very important that we do support the whole world in this global pandemic because that's where variants of concern will come. We have seen some of the variants that have have developed so far, including the the, the Delta, um, does does uh, but does partially affect the the vaccine uh, efficacy, but not to a great extent. Um, so we're always looking to see whether that may happen in the future, uh, and that may be something that leads to to further boosters. But at this stage, all of the variants that are in in uh, circulating in the world, the vaccines that we have in Australia do work very very effectively um, to stop both severe disease and transmission of the virus. Uh, and so a third dose is likely at this stage to be the last dose that we have to do. It's quite possible that's the case. We've, we've got that, you know, we, we know a lot about vaccines in, in, other, in other viruses. This is the very first virus that we've had a vaccine for coronavirus. Um, but, you know, hepatitis virus, for example, you know, two or three doses is likely to give uh, lifelong immunity. And that's, uh, that's what we hope for with these. But it's early days and uh, we're only less than a year in. So we need to, need to follow up people and to see how that develops over time. I know Israel doesn't qualify you as fully vaccinated unless you've had three shots. Do you think that'll become the case here? So at, the, at this stage, two, do, two doses qualifies you for anything that, that, that will, will, will uh, depend on being fully vaccinated. Um, and that's the case even with the immunocompromised uh, um, announcement today. Uh, but that's something we'll, we'll see over time. But at this stage, two doses is fully vaccinated. A third dose will be a booster to assist into the future, um, subject to a target advice, as we've discussed. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, I do want to uh, finish where I started just by saying that there are important reasons for hope today. Uh, to see uh, a million doses in the last three days, a, a record three-day period, uh, Australia passing the 80% first and 60% second uh, combination. Um, and uh, when we see what's happening in New South Wales uh, with cases uh, reducing significantly from 1,500 a day, um, uh, having more than more than halved, um, we see the pathway forwards that vaccines save lives and protect lives. And so if you haven't been vaccinated, please come forward. If you are due for your second dose, please come forward. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much.